listeners and welcome to the latest episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I am your host, Jason Johnston Yellen. I am joined today and I am joined as always. Sometimes, Joshua, I just like saying that out loud. I know it comes from another podcast that we do <laughs> and you get to say it. Sometimes I just like saying it out loud. And here he is, Joshua Hatton. I almost sneezed directly into this microphone because I got a cold going on. But for you, Jason, I thought to myself, grapefruit, and then I didn't sneeze. That's how you that's how you stop yourself from sneezing. You say grapefruit. And then wow. I did that. I appreciate that you're wearing a mask while we record this online. That one you can understand me. Wow, something just improved. I don't know what it is. <laughs> so in each episode of Extra Extra, Josh and I get together. We bring a whiskey news story to the attention of the other, often whiskey, and we read it in the first half, we riff on it in the second half, and we always, without fail, you can set your watch by us, get out of here in a tight 35. Wow. Wow. Are you sure? Is this an April Fool's episode? I don't think it's an April (laughs) Fool's episode. (laughs) You know what? I feel like I've got a little bit of that in my blood, because... Because Frederick Keeter, mm. long-time listener, long-time Single Cast Nation supporter, he is he is beloved within the nation, mm-hmm. and I'm sure within his own home and beyond, but I, I don't <laughs> want to speak so. on behalf of others. I can only speak on behalf of us in the nation. But he sent in a piece from the Bourbon Review that you and I were prepared to cover in today's episode... <laughs> Until we started reading about things like Mash.com and Grinder, and we checked the date of the article and published on April 1st, mm-hmm. 2022, mm-hmm. Tito Belvedere tells us that Old Forester's Jackie Zaikan is taking a bold stance on single barrels, quote, we want them off the market. And you and I agreed yeah. that that was a bold stance. It, we yes, it seemed it seemed bold, <laughs> and it seemed like, but it didn't seem unheard of, right? Because I think we covered an article some time back where where there was this discussion of our single barrels taking the uh, attention away from the core product, or maybe there, there was a, a, someone who had written in and we talked about that idea. And so I had that in my head when we got this article from (laughs) Frederick and I was like, all right, okay, it's getting serious here, but no, it's the opposite of serious. It's, it is a joke. There is one line in it. Old Forrester and parent company Brown Foreman have set a goal of eliminating the problem of barrels without partners by 2024. <laughs> like this, this Tito Belvedere, who I believe is a non diplomat. Oh my gosh. I, I will, of course it <laughs> is. There's, Tito's in Belvedere. Come on. You know, you can, <laughs> I just don't want to go wholehearted into the night saying Tito Belvedere is a 100% made up name. Right. I am 99.9% certain. However, I will leave room for doubt. So, so the fact that you and I bring uh, news stories to the attention of the other round about April 1 mm-hmm. can, can sometimes make this task a little tricky. Indeed. But for some of our dear listeners out there, they will be familiar with the Whiskey Sponge, a satirical whiskey website mm-hmm. that on April 1st every year posts a very serious piece <laughs> <laughs> which I always and, love, right? It's it's like it's it becomes opposite day, which is wonderful. And so this was brought to our attention by our very own Jess Lomas. Mm-hmm. And we have read it and we have passed it around within the, the company. And, and all four of us, I'm including Elijah in here, thought that this was excellent. Now, the one thing to say is it, it has some serious length to it. Thank you. Oh, the article, mm-hmm. yes. It's always the length of the article with you. And so we're not going to read the whole thing this day. We are going to leave our our dear listeners to venture off to whiskeysponge.com and look up the article entitled Some Thoughts on Independent Bottling. Mm -hmm. But but we thought, given we're, you know, given what we do as a company and given what those of us connected to Single Cast Nation do as a company... 
And given what a lot of our very loyal followers in the nation do with independent bottling, we thought this would be a good article to cover for the audience that we enjoy. Yes. Yeah, great article. I'm excited to cover it. So we will make some edits along the way. But here we have some thoughts on independent bottling. Uh, I should say Whiskey Sponge is Angus McRailed. It is, yes. Who you may very well know from the Old and Rare Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may also know from Whiskey Fun, where he writes alongside Serge Valentin, mm-hmm. uh, someone we respect a lot, whose palate we thoroughly enjoy and goes back a decade plus. plus. A decade and a half there. Yeah, oh, gosh. I always forget that. Time goes forward into the future. Never stops. And things in the past become longer ago. That's remarkable. Oh, speaking of, here's the subheadline. What have I learned since starting doing independent bottling a couple of years ago? Oh, yeah, yeah. go on, Angus, tell us. Now, these are all numbered. I will read the numbers as we go along. And so, dear listeners, as you venture into the article for yourself, you will know what has been read to you and you will know what to add. And I'll be sure to link the article when we post this on Facebook. And if you go to our website and such, you, you'll you'll have access to it. That way you don't have to search. You're a good man, Charlie Brown, slash Joshua Morrissey hat. <laughs> Number one, everything takes far longer and is far more complicated than it feels like it should be. Mm-hmm. Perhaps this is the case for many types of business. But the act of disgorging a cask into bottles... Labeling them and then selling them is riven with pitfalls. Pitfalls, which can be by nature logistic, regulatory, resulting from human error of judgment, miscommunication, timing, finance. The list is bewildering and inexhaustible. And I think you and I agree, when we hear the word pitfalls, we're also thinking about literal pitfalls from Indiana Jones. I was thinking the the game where you're just running along and then you jump on the three alligators' heads and then you do the swing and everything. But, and Frogger. But uh, t- I'll tell you, that what Angus has summed up in that one, you know, quick little paragraph, amazing. Uh, just yeah. So as, soon as, I, as soon as I read that first paragraph, I thought, oh, I, I am going to read this really long article. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if he's that right in paragraph number one, I wonder how right he is the rest of the way. <laughs> number two, people matter. More than ever, smaller brands and bottlers are attached to people and names and faces and personalities. Number three, labels matter. People matter are influenced by labels and by the presentation, values, design, and style of brands. This isn't to drift into marketing doublespeak. Rather, it's just an observation that people place value upon that which they find beautiful, or funny, or just aesthetically pleasing in ways they can't quite articulate. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of our conversation with Mo uh, on a recent One Nation Under Whiskey, where we talked about the labels that Mo has taken great pains to design for some of our most important bottlings. 100%. Number four, and I, I, like, I like everything, but I like this point. The whiskey itself still matters, but arguably not as much as it used to. People are more motivated than ever by the contents of a bottle. But that motivation is more varied, diverse, educated, and often more cynical than ever before. The diversity and number of people around the world that are interested in, desire to possess, and are willing to pay serious money for good quality single malt whiskey is larger than ever. That said, while single malts may be booming, they are still a niche product. As such, it is unsurprising that the reasons why people are interested in the liquid aspect of bottles is also diversifying and becoming more complex. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Everybody in italics (laughs) wants Springbank, Beaumore and Laphroaig. Only a few want Macduff. Mm-hmm. I have a Macduff sample sitting right next to me <laughs> on my desk right now. Look at that. There I'm showing go. it to Joshua to prove that I am not a liar. Everyone, italics, calculates on price for everything. Everything is italicized. 
Lots of people flip. Lots of people open and drink. Lots of folk do a mix of both. Few whiskey people conform rigidly to one group or easy category. And just to add this in very quickly, this made me think of, of a line that we've been repeating a lot since our time with Bespoken, mm. which is there are more consumers out there than we can get our head around. Yeah. And they're all looking for something different. Everyone's looking for a slightly different experience. Finding your people yeah. is so important. Yeah, and j- just to clarify for our listeners that may not understand your reference to Bespoken, we did an interview with Martin and Stu from Bespoken Spirits that do, uh, they create whiskey using what they call craft aging technology. It's basically accelerated aging, but it's far more nuanced than that. And if you're interested in that, you can go back to the previous One Nation Under Whiskey episode. Yeah, this is good. We've we've touched upon season six, episode two. That's bespoken. Season six, episode three. That's Mo. Mm-hmm. This is oh, lovely, lovely callbacks. Uh, number five, we got a, a little a bit sweary here. So mm-hmm. if you've got children in the car, um, have them cover their own ears. Don't you reach into the back to cover their ears if you're driving or in the passenger seat. <laughs> number five, selling whiskey is fucking hard work. Everyone thinks sponge bottles fly off the shelf, and at one point they did for a brief while. Sometimes they still do now. But it isn't the word sponge that shifts them so much as the word Bowmore or Ardnamurkin. Selling whiskey is tough. Mm -hmm. There has never been so much interest in single malt whiskey, but there's also never been so much of it on the market. So much diversity and volume of bottled products in retail and at auction in the booming secondary market. If you're a whiskey enthusiast, the competition for your money is fierce and you have never had such a wealth of opportunity to spend (laughs) that money. This is something we forget in a world where we obsess over scores and prices and single casks. Poor single casks, just out there looking for a partner. (laughs) We miss the fact... We miss the fact that there's quite a lot of good whiskey available between 60 and 100 pounds in the shops. Despite what it may seem like, independent bottlings do not always self-evaporate from the virtual shelves. Angus then goes on to explore a bit more about scores and reviews, of which he is a part. But we're going to jump into number seven here, which in itself brings context to what he's talking about with scores and reviews. Mm -hmm. Number seven, whiskey is better than it used to be, Mm -hmm. which is one way of explaining why there's stacks of 90-point whiskeys sloshing about and cluttering up the internet and your shelves. Another way of saying that is that whiskey is more clever, more technological, more informed, more consistent, more predictable, more curated, more soulless. Oof, oof. I All feel right. like we're coming back to point yeah, seven in I the think, second I half. Think so too. Yep. There's an abundance of, quote, very good box ticking drams out there. There's a dearth of stunning, heart stopping, deeply idiosyncratic, joy spinning whiskies that make you realize all over again why you adore this drink and are bothering with it in the first place. They still come along, but rarely. Yep. I, I, Cat, I, meat pigeons. <laughs> I loved those last few sentences. Um, Yeah, I definitely want to come back to that. Number eight. There may be a lot more good whiskey out there, but there's still an ocean of dullness. The very bad and the very good are comprehensively outweighed by the very boring. Most whiskey is boring, mass-produced industrial distillate flavoured with oak. I'm guessing we've got a few listeners out there starting to get a little uncomfortable in their in their seats or on the treadmill if they're running or walking while listening to this. Most people instinctively know this 
And that's why they are willing to pay a bit extra for the good stuff, both modern or old in style, and often a lot extra for the very good stuff. That's why the laws of supply and demand swoop fast and vicious upon the quote-unquote very good. Mm. There's a lot more consensus on what's very good than we often acknowledge. Hmm. I want to come back to that as well. That, that's an interesting point right there. Yeah, I, I think it's all incredibly well said. Number nine. Pricing for bottles of good malt whiskey is undeniably getting painful for everyone. But the price of casks is more painful still. Mm-hmm. The price of casks is going up faster than the prices of bottles. The result of which is Indie bottler margins get squeezed. Uh, so we're we're gonna we're gonna close out this thought with an, another couple of paragraphs. Number ten, who is to blame for point number nine? <laughs> <laughs> if you've read these sorts of rambling, serious writing posts I do from time to time on here, you'll know that I am not a fan of unnuanced hot take style oversimplifications of these sorts of complex situations. But in this case, I'll make an exception if you'll permit me a whinge. <laughs> Roll up your sleeves. Uh, get, the, get the bleep machine ready. Uh-huh. It's the fault of all these flash-in-a-pan, cask investment, snake oil peddling, charlatan, liquid gold... Asset, portfolio, capital, thousand percent return, anonymous. <laughs> They're spoiling things far more than any bottle flippers, and they should fuck off. Oh gosh, I that 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 last sentence got me to completion, Jason. I just it it is so spot on, and it's so refreshing to hear someone just say it i feel as if we've i know we're we're meant to be you know be riffing in the next thing (laughs) but you know i feel as if we've touched on it like we've tried to be diplomatic about what's going on but sometimes it's just nice to see it laid out so plainly uh it, it that it was just so incredibly refreshing to, to read that, and I'm not going to lie to you, Jason, I have read that point number 10 at least six times. And it was such a, <laughs> so it was, it was both uh, sad and a joy to read <laughs> all at once. <laughs> well, you, let's see how much you enjoy 10B. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's definitely a bit more complicated than that. And at the same time, probably just a lot to do with human greed Mm -hmm. but I really don't like these bullshit investment companies so let's just all agree to blame them some more yes Uh, there's a there's a there's a lot more a lot more a lot more to delve into but I'm gonna jump ahead to to number 22 and and get us out of here on on a more positive note and then we can circle back to all the negativity in the second half uh, of the podcast. Uh But here we go. Last paragraph and we'll get out of here. Number 22. Scotland isn't, and I'll emphasize that, Scotland is not automatically the king of whiskey anymore. Mm -hmm. There's loads of great distilleries dotted about the world producing everything from the fantastic to the funky. I see this only as a good thing for whiskey drinkers and for independent bottlers. I also see it as a perfectly healthy thing for Scotland. As a Scottish person who is emotionally invested in Scottish single malt whiskies, I see only healthy competition and the ball sitting in Scotland's court. I also see more than a few folk here rising to all these new wave challenges. We're going to bring the article to a close there. I highly, highly encourage you to go and visit it for yourself, dear listener. As Joshua says, the link will be 
in various places, including the website, Facebook, so on and so forth. Just go to whiskeysponge.com and you'll see the article about independent bottling from April 1. You cannot miss it. Mm -hmm. Here comes a short break and then a little bit of riffing. Welcome to the second half. Joshua, I hope you've got your riffing pants on. Actually, I, I just wish you had any pants on, to be honest. <laughs> I know there's a couple of portions of this that you want to come back to and delve into a little more. I have my own portion here, which is just starting very much at the beginning, which is this point number one of how long everything takes. Mm -hmm. And that was true pre-pandemic and pre-global supply chain collapse, and pre-Brexit, and pre-tariffs. Yeah. It, it, I, I, I didn't mean to leave that hanging, but I just couldn't keep going. I, I took a serious look at the window there and contemplated defenestration. Yeah, but it's... It's it's the old salt in the wound, right? The wound was already there. And you're just adding in all the other shit. Like, at least at least we had the wound. Wait, salt? Are you putting salt or shit in your wounds? How's this going down? Why not both, Jason? Why not both? So listen, that's an infection waiting to happen. I mean, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the the fact that everything took longer than it felt it should. At least was a known commodity, right? You, you knew how to work within those constraints. You knew to build time into things, to pad mm -hmm. time into things. And we've just entered a world where everything is an unknown. And, and yes, you can continue to say, well, you know, we'll just continue building time into things. But every time you feel as if you have a new deadline, you know, or a new, or, a new date, well, that changes. And, and a very good example is our, our backwoods rye, which was meant yeah. to hit our shores in early March, and then it was late March, and now we're looking at May 1. And I'm not going to lie to you, I wouldn't be surprised if it turns into June. And it's, I have no confidence in, in any of those dates. You know, it used to be you can, you can lick your thumb and put, put your thumb up in the air and you'd feel which way the wind is blowing. And now the wind is blowing in all different directions and you just don't know which way to go. It's just gotten worse. That's all. Uh, no, I, <laughs> you're exactly right, which is why I just stopped reeling off my list and really just stopped using words all told. Yeah. It's incredibly difficult. And then this is coming from somebody sitting in Scotland who's <laughs> right. buying casks in Scotland yeah. and moving those casks within Scotland and selling them within the UK, right? Yep. It's, you know, you're sitting in Connecticut. I'm sitting, sitting in Virginia. Elijah's sitting outside Seattle. Jess is sitting in Glasgow. And we're trying to move things around the world. And... I remember a time when I first started feeling like the world was becoming very small. Yeah. And, and it was a time when, when you and I would jump on a plane and go to Scotland. We do a week in Scotland. We go to Scotland four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to go to Maltstock in the Netherlands, we'd jump on a plane, we'd go to Maltstock. If we needed casks moved, if we were shipping from Scotland over to a warehouse in San Francisco, okay, that was going to take hmm, four to six weeks. Okay, as you said earlier in this answer... Uh, in, in this in this session of roofing, y you knew what the numbers were, mm -hmm. and now it's pick a number, double it, and then start adding weeks to it, and and it's very hard to predict anything. And and that's right now. that's just your shipping, right? Then there's the glass, and that's then there's just shipping. Then there's labels, right? Then there's corks. It's 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 just it's all the things all the time. Nothing has been unaffected by the the laundry list of things that you mentioned before: Brexit, COVID, global supply chain, etc. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, nightmarish. And so that would be the operations side, yeah, where you're just simply trying to get casks bottled, labeled, and and for sale. Angus goes on to talk about 
the great difficulties in purchasing casks. Mm -hmm. And I know that was a part you wanted to return to. And so if there was any more window dressing you wanted to add to, to Angus's words on that. Well, you, you jumped ahead a little bit, but... We'll come back to other details. Don't worry. Don't fret. <laughs> You're in the hands of a professional. Where do, where, where, where do I start, Jason? It's... Give me a second here. I need to gather myself. I really, I need to gather myself because I find, I find this situation that an honest, independent bottler, like, like, like I find the situation that we and Angus and, you know, insert independent bottler here, mm -hmm. we're all in the same situation where mm -hmm. we're competing. We as independent bottlers are competing for the same casks that an investor would compete for, right? And your investor does not understand all of the backroom stuff, all of the different layers that go on, the costs involved for moving casks around, the costs involved to bottling and labeling. And then if you have a, dis you know, in the UK, you don't need to have a distributor, but, you know, you have distributors outside of the UK, right? People just look at a cask, it has a distillery, it has an age, it has a cask type, it has an ABV. And so then they'll go to Whiskey Exchange or Master of Malt and they'll say, well, geez, that bottle sells for 300 pounds. And they're telling me that I will have 300 bottles within this cask. <laughs> Therefore, that's what this is worth. No, that is not what that cask is worth. You've cut out every person that needs to make a little money along the way to get that bottle to market. And, and that's just saying what the bottle is worth from a retail price standpoint, not even from this, you know, potential cask futures garbage and what it could be worth. And the fact of the matter is, if you see a cask of Macallan and it's 25 years old and you'll see a price for it nowadays for a million pounds or some ungodly amount, there's not a single fucking guarantee that that whiskey is worth its weight in whiskey. It sure isn't worth 1.2 million pounds. It may be to someone who has serious fuck off money that doesn't care about it, but <laughs> to the put to the general drinking public. I'm sorry. You continue, please stop me ranting because I'm. I think I'm getting a bit <laughs> See, incoherent. So you've angry. done the exact same thing I did with the with the list, right? The, 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 the problematic list, which is you just get to a point where your brain just says, just stop using words. Just stop. <laughs> just sit quietly and wait for this to pass. Um, I see a bifurcated problem here mm -hmm. that you've just articulated. One we've been grappling with, I would say since the beginning, but then this new one. And since the beginning... You and I being independent bottlers, we've approached distilleries, conglomerates, whoever owns the distillery is in charge of the product. And we've said, look, we'd like to buy some casks for bottling to sell to the nation, mm. whether that be online or in retail, whether that be US, Canada, rest of the world. And some of them have said, okay, yep, absolutely, let's have a chat. And some of them have said, well, we already sell casks to the public. And we have said, nope, we've seen your cask buying program available to the general public. We've seen the pricing there. We would like trade pricing. Yeah. We'd like to have a trade conversation, not a punter conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we've seen over this decade is that more and more punters, more and more groups of punters have had access to casks that they've done exactly what you've said, which is, hey, there's 20 of us here. Let's yeah. buy that cask. Yeah. Let's yeah. split the bottles between the 20 of us and we'll get a rake of bottles. Won't cost us that much money. And then they do what you say, which is they then total a bottle price <laughs> by the number of bottles in the cask. And they go, holy moly, we just bought a 30,000 pound cask for 10,000 pounds, right? Holy moly, are we ahead of the game? Uh -huh. And for us in the trade, we're saying, 
yeah, 10,000 ain't going to cut it. That's not going to work if we're going to put the margins on it. So, so for me, that's, that's fork number one. Mm-hmm. And then fork number two is the investment side of things where a cask is a cask is a cask. Yeah. And it's not about a group of 20 investment bankers saying, hey, if we just go ahead and split this million pound Macallan, we're going to have a blast. Instead, it's if we sit on this million pound Macallan for 12 months, it could be a 1.3 million pound cask of Macallan. Mm-hmm. And if we sit on another 12 months after that, it might be a 1.6 or a 2 million pound cask of Macallan. It's got nothing to do with bottling. It's got nothing to do with drinking. It's got nothing to do with enjoyment. Zero. It's got everything to do with ROI, return on investment. And for people like us, people like Angus, who are involved in bottling wonderful tasting spirit, that's the fiscal issues that we are running up against. And that's what's causing the great frustration. And that's, to my mind, what's causing... There's a framework being built here that's a little wobbly, that's getting a little top-heavy and is going to fall over and take out a number of people with it. I, w- I want to use this this part, and, and I know you know we, we've we're probably going to go over uh, a little bit here, but there was something that Angus had said earlier about yeah here we go in in number nine where he says pricing for bottles of good malt whiskey is undeniably getting painful for everybody, but price of casks is more painfully still. The price of casks is going up faster than the price of bottles, the result of which is indie bottler margins get squeezed. And and this is the one part where I agree with but disagree with at the same time, right? If an indie if an independent bottler needs to not just maintain but grow they won't live long on squeezed margins they need that margin right we need that margin to invest in other casks and the only way to do that is to get the margin we need to operate as a business and when we do that it means the price of independently bottled whiskeys are simply going to go up and that Mm -hmm. in and of itself could do some serious damage to independently bottled whiskey writ large because, you know, it used to be you could find some deals in independently bottled whiskey. Now, granted, not always, but you could, especially in in brands like Macduff or or brands like Glenn Talkers and and things like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, But even now, right, and we may have discussed it on on a previous episode, think of the... We saw some eight-year-old Glenn Talkers on on a on a list somewhat recently, and where Creative Whiskey Company, maybe four, five years back, released some eight-year-old Dark as Night Sherry Cast, and you can buy that for eighty dollars on a, on a U.S. store shelf. We would have to charge around four hundred dollars for a similar Glenn Talkers. We couldn't even like we couldn't even trim our margins if we wanted that, right? So we yeah. have to. Yeah. Right. And so and so those deals are going to go away. And so my big concern here is that, yes, there, there's going to be a bubble. It's going to burst. Things are going to topple. But how much damage will the independent bottling community take and how many could we potentially lose along the way? Uh, how many who wanted to start just good, honest independent bottling companies will fold far before, far sooner than they likely would have in other scenarios. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a troubling situation. But with a, with a few minutes remaining, I, I want to get our riffing out on the same positive point that we got out uh, on Angus's article. What's your, what's your take? I know what your take is, but to get it on wax, what, what's your take on... Scotland is not automatically the king of whiskey anymore. That's a tough one for me because my, you know, my number one passion is Scotch whiskey. However, 
it's clear that your Amruts and Paul Johns and Milk and Honeys and Pindarins, the list yep. will go on. Cavalans of the world are pro- over here nodding my head, right? Yeah, are producing world class whiskeys uh, of the highest order, right? Just phenomenal quality. Uh, and and follow, I think what Angus was saying before, where whiskey overall has just gotten better. I, I, mm-hmm. I think that you know uh, world whiskey producers only help that. What I would say is, while Scotland may not be the king of whiskey anymore, Scottish whiskey may not be the king of whiskey anymore. I think the world single malt producers press the fact that malt whiskey remains the king. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my take wasn't so much that the throne had been usurped, but that it was more egalitarian than that. Mm. That you you didn't just have to go to Scotch to get the best whiskey in the world. You can find it in other countries as well as Scotland now. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think to his earlier point of, and you and I hear it going around distilleries, uh, in Scotland, and, and you and I have mentioned it on both podcasts plenty of times, you hear the word consistent consistently. Oh, so that's the C word I'm not allowed to to bleep. I bleeped your <laughs> other C word. <laughs> yeah, no, this one this one you're allowed to not <laughs> okay. bleep. Um, <laughs> and, and so it is, right? And so this sense that whiskey is being made as well, better than it's ever been made in Scotland to date. But that consistency has you going, well, I I know where I stand there. I know Mm. what I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. Wood policy. I think the number of distilleries have implemented top-notch wood policy in Scotland Mm -hmm. is probably higher than it's ever been as well. But then we see the new distilleries coming online in Scotland. We're seeing those internationals that you mentioned. We're seeing the rise of American single malt, Mm, Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest alone, Westland, Westward, Copper Works, near me, Virginia Distillery Company, right? And and, and, and more 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 and more, more, right? I think there are opportunities to explore the whiskey world, finding little gems as you go along, while knowing if you return to Scotland and you return to a traditional Scottish distillery with traditional distilling practices, you know you're going to get something worth your money out of that bottle. And so I, I, I like the idea of it becoming more egalitarian and the opportunity to look for different opportunities in different corners of the world. There you go. That that is a nice and positive place to leave it, Jason. As we always say, like Frederick Keeter, if you'd like to reach out to us with a story for coverage, we are questions at onenationunderwhiskey.com, no E in whiskey. If you fancy it, you can drop an email to info at singlecastnation.com. We've gone a hair, or three hairs, or five hairs, hmm. over our very tight, That's, very yeah. regularly achieved 35-minute yeah, mark. Yeah, I mean, especially the way you opened this up, you know, we're like, we always do this, but, you know. But I've enjoyed the conversation, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. feel like it's been time well spent. As always. I mean, it was time with me, so. Well, and with me. So... <laughs> On that note, Joshua, we're going to get out of here. And until next time, I'm going to say peace. Peace.